morning, Freedom Church. How are we doing today? All right. Happy Palm Sunday. Listen, we are in week two of our series, The Gospel Truth, leading up to Easter. And today we are unpacking the death of Jesus and its impact on us. And I've entitled this message today, The Life I Now Live. So a few months ago, I was actually on a sabbatical. I was taking time to just regroup with God. And one of the weeks that I was off, I was driving down to North Carolina and I was telling the Lord, I was praying in my car, just having this emo moment. And I was saying, Lord, I just want to be closer to you, God. I just want to close everything off and I just want to be closer to you. And I felt like the Lord spoke back to me in this moment. And he said, you can't get closer to me, Jeremy, than you already are because you're already in me. See, you can get maybe deeper, you can grow some roots and get more grounded in me, but he says, you're trying to get to a place you're already in. He says, I want you to live out of this place instead of trying to get into this place. And that's what I wanna to talk to us about today. And I believe what I'm gonna share with you this morning, if you will listen with your heart, no matter if you're seeking or if you're just now discovering, if you've been, you've been walking with Jesus for a long time, it can, I believe this can change how you view your relationship with God. And I believe it's the, the core of the gospel. Did you know that the Bible only mission, mentions the word Christian just three times? But the phrase in Christ is mentioned over 70 times. In fact, if you were to use the Bible to define what it means to be Christian, it would not be the word Christian. In fact, the word Christian was never self-applied, but it was used by unbelievers to identify Jesus' followers. Now, I'm not going on a crusade for us to get rid of the word Christian. That's not the point today. But God's definition of you, of me, of us is in Christ. Can we say in Christ? Not Christ-like first to be in Christ. It is in Christ. And when you are in Christ, you spend time with Christ so that you can be like Christ. This is not mental gymnastics here. This is not a play of words. This is, I believe, a game changer of what the gospel is, what Jesus reveals to us. Paul actually says it like this in Galatians 2. He says, for when I tried to keep the law, it condemned me. So I died to the law. I stopped trying to meet all its requirements so that I might live for God. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless, for if keeping the law could make us right with God, then there was no need for Christ to die. Let's pray. Father, we come before you in Jesus' name, the name that is above every name, name at which every knee shall bow, in heaven and on the earth and under the earth. God, we're here this morning. We humble ourselves. We bow before you. We bow before your word, before the authority of your word, God. We pray that you will meet us here this morning by your spirit, that you will open our eyes to your word, and we can apply these truths to our lives. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. So the majority of the New Testament is written by Paul. And you got to know something about Paul. Paul, his mission was a, was a calling. He was called to the Gentiles, which is you and I, right? Most of us today are not Jews. We're Gentiles. And you see, Paul is writing always is saying in Christ or through him or in him. And Paul made a big deal about being in Jesus. And I found it interesting, and I asked myself this question as, as, as I was preparing for today. Why did Paul, and where did Paul get the revelation of in Christ? And I have an idea. Take it or leave it. Hopefully, you're taking it. Um, but when Paul met Jesus for the first time, I think it shook him with the fact that when he was persecuting Christians, he was persecuting Jesus. Jesus says in Acts 9, Saul, which was Paul's name before his conversion, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He didn't say, Paul, Saul, why are you persecuting Christians? He says, why are you persecuting me? And I think Paul got a revelation. Jesus doesn't just relate to his followers. Jesus is in them and they are in Jesus. And I think it opened up a new world for Paul. I want to be a part of a faith where there is a, a God is not just somebody I can try to connect to or be like. It is someone that I can live in and that they can live in me. And this is not us being God, it's us being in God. And that's why Paul's revelation is so powerful. It's why Paul never preached the commandments could change your life. He always preached Christ. Because as Paul knew, and as we need to grasp today, you can change everything about your life 
apply spiritual principles and laws, but the core of who you are is never changed until you get in Jesus. Amen? So in the book of Acts, chapter 17, when Paul is speaking to a lot of pagans here, and pagans are the people who don't believe in God, right? They're they worshiping other idols. And he says, God created us. He created boundaries for our existence on earth. And then he says this, that God gave us a time within these boundaries that God, that God created us so that people will seek God. In other words, Paul is saying, we have a purpose that is to seek God. And then he says this, that they will grope for him, that they will try to fill him, try to find him. And you would think, yeah, that's the purpose, right? That's the, that's, the, that's the purpose of Christianity, constantly pressing into God, constantly seeking God. Yeah, I feel that sometimes I feel God, sometimes I don't, right? Sometimes he's close, sometimes I feel like he's not near to me. And as you're thinking, this is the Christian existence, but it's not. Because then Paul then says, but we are in him. Verse 28 says, though he is not far from each one of us, for in him, can we say in him? We live and move and have our being. This completely shifts the game, family, from trying to grope for God and feel God. And am I in him? Is he close? Am I close? Am I too far? How can I get closer to God? And Paul says, we are in him. So what does this all have to do with death? I mean, that's the point of today's message. So we're going to start from the beginning. In Genesis, I told you all we're starting from the beginning, the Lord took the man and he put him in the Garden of Eden. And the Garden became, came before Adam, as we know, right? And Christ came before, as Christ came before Christianity. See, so God always creates an environment, an element, and then he creates living beings to live in that environment. And so God makes his, this environment, this, this Eden, and that's where his, his headquarters are, as you as we would say, his home office. And the garden was more than just a beautiful garden where Adam was running around butt naked, right? He was, it was actually a convergence between God's spiritual family and his earthly family. His presence roamed there, and Adam lived in that garden, and he lived off of, off of that garden, and he got married there to Eve, and, and so um, God's presence was there. But then Adam, through sin, through deception, through the life of, through the lie of the serpent, he gets kicked out of the garden. And I want you to notice um, what happens, what begins to happen after that. Adam becomes a baby daddy, right? He starts having children. And guess where all these children are born? They're born outside of the garden. None of them were born inside. That means that every descendant of Adam came outside of the element of God's presence, outside of a relationship with God. You and I are descendants of Adam. And proof of that, even if you don't believe in the Bible, let me tell you this. I'm going to tell you one thing. There is a natural inclination in us to do bad, right? There is, there, there is a natural inclination for us. We don't have to train ourselves to do that. I can tell you that for my kids. I can teach them how to write, read, talk, eat, whatever. But I don't have to teach them how to lie. I don't have to teach them how to do, say things they're not supposed to be saying. Any parents say amen. All right, back to the story. All right. So Adam's been kicked out of the presence because of sin. And then God is working on a plan to bring us back in, bring Adam back in, not into the garden, but to bring us into something else. Actually, it's into Jesus Christ. And so God put Adam into the garden and God put us into Christ. And it takes us to the New Testament now, John 15. This is what Jesus is saying. He's giving us the same imagery of the garden again. And he says that my father is the vine dresser. He is, some versions say he is a farmer. He is the gardener. And Jesus then says, and then he is the vine. And so God takes Jesus and plants him under earth's soil. And God takes us, humanity, and he places us in Jesus Christ. Jesus actually predicts his death using similar language on Palm Sunday, the first day of Holy Week, which is today, the more you know. And so, but hold on. So, but we can't just get into Jesus until we get out of this bad boy, Adam, our sin nature, what we inherited, this body of ours that this is outside of the presence of God. And so, I just to paint a little picture here. Um, before Liz and I started dating, I had another girlfriend, surprise, surprise, and knew it wasn't a right fit. But you know how we do when you're very young, you know, um, dating the wrong people. Needless to say, we broke up. It needed to happen. And I was free. But I did continue to entertain and talk to this person. 
um, because there's no one around until I had feelings for Liz. And then I'm really sharing a lot more about myself than I should be. But anyway, in this moment, you know, I knew there was something that I had to do. I had to stop talking to this person. And I won't go into all this story and how I did it. And you probably won't agree. I don't know if I agree how, how it happened, but you, but she's married. I'm married. We got kids. Okay. We get to the point. God can't take me into Jesus until he takes me out of Adam. See, a lot of us want to stay within Adam, our old self, our old ways of doing things. We want to stay with our ex and still have what's next. So we cannot be in Jesus until we exit out of Adam. Are you guys with me this morning? So how does he, how does he get us out of our old self? How does he get us out of Adam? He brings Jesus on the cross. Jesus dies for our sins. He takes the care of this penalty. This, he takes care of this separation that we have from God. And something else happens on the cross. God takes the old me that I got from Adam and he crucifies it with Jesus. Romans 6 says this in verse 6 and 7. It says, for we know that our old self, this is the part of us that's born outside of the presence of God, was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free <clears throat> from sin. Everybody say amen. So not only did Jesus die for our sins, but we die because God could not bring the new me in without taking the old me out. How do we get into Adam? Through birth. How do we get out of Adam? Through death. Listen, born into the Moore family through birth. The only way I can get exited is through death. And Adam, we're born into Adam, into sin, into separation from God, constantly groping, trying to find God, but the access is closed. And God says, I cannot bring you into my son until I take you out of your sin. And the way I take you out of your sin is I let Jesus die on the cross, cursed to hang on a tree for your sin. And while he's dying, I'm going to take your human nature and I'm going to attach it to his cross. See, the cross of Jesus ends up being not just a place where Jesus is dying for you. The cross is also the place where you are dying with him. For those of you who are coming for the first time, you're like, why is this guy shouting like this? You know, I get excited talking about the gospel. This is the good news, family. Jesus saying on the cross, not only have I given my blood for your sins, I took your, my, your old man and I nailed it to the cross so you can exit Adam. But I want you to write something down if you're taking notes. Romans 7, it says, so my dear brothers and sisters, this is the point. You died to the power of the law when you died with Christ. And now you are united with the one who was raised from the dead. As a result, we can produce a harvest of good deeds for God. See, I want you to notice that they say that I killed the law because I couldn't keep it. Scripture says God killed me because I couldn't keep it. Right? He didn't just, he didn't just kill us, that our sin nature and just put us in, out of our misery, put us out of our circulation. He killed us so that we can now be united with Jesus, so that we can now begin to bear, bear fruit and produce some good works, not in our own strength, but in him. And you guys ever use the Fitness Pal um, uh, app? And I, I use it, actually you can tell I'm so fit today, right? No. Um, but you know, you use it, you track your macros, how much protein and carbs you're eating a day. And you know, when you have goals, it's easy. It's great when you're hitting it. But when you're not, you know it's easy to go in and change your goals for the day so that you can pretend that you are hitting them. I'm not saying I did that. I'm just saying that it is easy to do that. Um, if I'm honest, I have done that before, and this is, what, this is the reality. I'm just going to be vulnerable. I actually cheated because I lowered the standard to meet my current level of criteria, my current level of engagement. But see, God doesn't lower his standard to meet us where we are. Nor does God come in and say, okay, just work a little harder to meet the criteria. No, God actually takes you completely out of the equation. He's saying, it's over for you. I'm, 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 I'm still holy. My standards are holy. My standards are still right because that's my character. But he, he said, not only can you not keep it, but I'm going to, by my grace and by my mercy, I want to give you a way out. I don't lower the law. I don't strengthen your old self. I give you a choice to crucify your old nature with its flaws and its proclivities to sin and bad habits. And I give you a choice to crucify it to, with my son's cross and allow you to be reborn in his resurrection so now Jesus can live 
through you. So what does this mean for Christ to live in us? That means, my friends, our best work in ourselves is not good enough. God doesn't want to repair us. He doesn't want to remodel us. He wants to replace us. Not in the sense that we completely scratch our personality or, you know, who you are as an individual. No, not in that sense, but it's the operating system in which we live. It's not an upgraded, it's not an updated version of yourself. That's what the Bible will call that dead works, not not bad works. Bad works are sin. Dead works is when we try to live for God in our own human strength. The motive is good, right? The intentions are good, but there's no power. So where is the power? Where does it come? It's not in saying, God, help me to be a better person. But it's saying, God, I surrender to you. I surrender to you to live through me. And this is not us quitting. It's not us trying to do good and just going on. And now we're going to be lawless and we're going to be reckless because Pastor Jay told us, look, we don't even have to try anymore. This is not what I'm even, that's not what I'm saying. Dude, I walk out of here saying that, okay? But this is, this is us saying, God, I surrender to you to live through me. Lord, would you take over? Let's carry on the will. we we'll say, Jesus, would you take the will? Would you take the will? So you can't work yourself into grace, into right standing with God. Paul says in Galatians 2, it would render Jesus' death meaningless. Galatians math goes something like this. Jesus plus nothing equals enough. Jesus plus works equals insufficient. See, these works, I'm talking about these, these laws, whether they be moral laws, whether they be the Ten Commandments, whether it be the laws of the world, whether it be expectations of others or expectations that we put on ourselves, eventually they will condemn us. They, they will have us on a roller coaster of pride and then self-loathing. At some point, something or someone will tell us that we've come up insufficient. So we have to surrender. I fear many of us have to accepted Jesus maybe as our savior, but we've fallen short of making Jesus our life. And so I want us to write this down if you're taking notes, that Christ gave his life on the cross, not to repair my life, but to replace my life as being my source. See, life in Christ is not a changed life, it's an exchanged life. There is a world of difference between asking God to help you to be holy and Christ living in you as your holiness. Jesus is not just my example to live by. Jesus is how I live. Philippians 1 is what Paul says. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So Jesus is crucified, but that's not where it ends. So you enter through birth, you're going to exit through death and through the son's death on the cross. But now, since it's dead, we got to do something with the body, right? We got to bury that bad Adam. Where do we bury it? How do we bury it? It's through baptism. Romans 6, 4 says, therefore we are buried with him through baptism into death. And as a Christian, I want us to get this. As, but if we're here, we're seeking. This is an historic fact. Jesus died on the cross and my old man died with it and was crucified there. And then it was buried through baptism, submerged. That's what that means, submerged. And now Jesus rose again three days later. And we rise with him. Colossians 2 puts it like this, starting in verse 12. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, hallelujah, who raised him from the dead. And you, you who were dead in your trespasses, God made alive with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. 1 Peter 1, 3 says it like this, blessed be, I'm getting excited now, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Hallelujah. So in Jesus' death, I die to this old self through his baptism. I'm buried and now Jesus is, rose again and I'm born again. So I'm not stuck now between two houses, between two families. I am born into a new family where the head of the family is Jesus. He's not outside of the garden. He's in God, and I am now in Jesus. I'm getting too excited here, guys, looking at my notes. I'm getting ahead of myself. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30, it says this. 
want us to get this today because Jesus is already inside of God's garden because he is God's vineyard. And now we get to be branches in his vineyard. First Corinthians says this, God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. God made us right with God. He made us pure and holy. He freed us from sin, meaning this is the work of God to place you into Jesus. We are in Christ because of God. Not because we're on a 40-day fast. Not because it's been 52 Sundays since we haven't missed Sundays. Uh, we, not because we tithe every single week. Not because we don't cuss and we don't drink. We ain't slept around in a few months. I mean, we, not because we work so hard and we deserve to be in Christ. No, you don't get into Jesus like that. You never got into Adam through sin. You, you got into Adam through birth and you inherited a sin nature. And so you had to die. And you had to be buried because that's what you do with dead things. And then God says, I will now raise you now to a new life. Meaning I don't want to keep you in limbo to die physically one day. And then you get to go to your sweet by and by, as my grandma would say. Jesus actually gives us access to a new life today. Anybody excited about that? Lord Jesus, help us today. A lot of us are looking only for Christ as a way to escape hell. That's not what the gospel is. The gospel is about being in Jesus. It's not giving you an insurance card. It's not giving you an escapism gospel. He's giving you Jesus. The gospel truth is God placing you from darkness into his son, in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection, and his son is eternal life, and, and in his son is wisdom, and in his son is not just going to heaven and escaping hell, it's living in his presence right now. And in his son, now you can bear fruit, and in his son, now you can do good works, and in his son, now you can talk to God, and now you can be near to God. Everything is in Jesus Christ. The Bible says we have no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus. It says we have a redemption in Christ. Can we say in Christ? It says God has reconciled the world through Christ. Can we say through Christ? Through Christ Jesus. God is doing nothing with you. I know this sounds crazy, and I hope it doesn't sound heretical, but God, nothing in your old man, it has been crucified. He's doing everything for you, but he's doing everything in his son. God is in love with his son. And he says, if you can believe that my son is the son of God, then you can be in him and me as well. So this is great, Pastor Jay. This is awesome. How do I get into Jesus? It's a great question. John 3.16 says it like this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Not behaves, but believes. You have to believe. What do you believe? That Jesus existed? No, demons do that. Unfortunately, that's the wrong password, okay, to get in. You have to believe that Jesus is the son of God. He's not just a truth. He is the truth. And when you believe in Jesus, then what begins to happen is God takes that faith he takes that faith in the Son of God. Remember, Paul says this in Galatians 2. We read this at the beginning of the sermon. We now live in this earthly body by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. See, this changes everything. Because it means that now we have faith in a God who now gets to determine what's good and what's not good. And God takes that faith and he says, I will account it to you righteousness, and then I will produce in you a new nature. And then to a simple trust, simple belief. And he goes even further because everything is in Christ. Can we say in Christ? Everything is in Christ and we are in him. See, you and I are like, I have this, you're like a light bulb, right? It has everything it needs to shine if it's in the socket. See, in Christ, you have everything Without me, Jesus says, you can do nothing. This is what he says in John 15. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I eat you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, though, 
you can do nothing. So it seems like Jesus is not saying, hey, I'm going to give you so much stuff to you. You can leave me and do whatever you want. And you got it still. It seems like he's saying, if you got it, it's only because you're in Jesus. Why is that? Because God doesn't want you to be enamored with the stuff. He doesn't want you to be devoted to the stuff. He doesn't want you to be worshiping the stuff. He wants you to worship Jesus. So if you're struggling with depression and you, and you want peace and you're struggling with anxiety and you want wholeness, see, when you come to Jesus, God wants you to be on the socket. See, the socket is Jesus. And then you can shine and then you can have your peace. Then you can have your righteousness. Then you can have your joy. Then you can have your salvation. You have everything in Jesus. Can we say in Jesus? I think everything, you know, I was thinking about this today. You know, a lot of people will, will come in and say, I believe in God, but I just haven't, ex just haven't, I'm struggling with my old man. I'm struggling with this old nature of mine. I haven't experienced any victory. I haven't seen any fruit in my life. I just want to say, you know, no, you're just a light bulb that has no light because you aren't in the socket. You're not abiding in Jesus, which is the second answer to this question, how do I get into Jesus? As I said in my opening, you already are in Jesus. You just have to remain. You just have to remain. What do I mean by this? You have to abide in him. Remember shortly to Jesus, shortly after Jesus said this in John, um, it says this, Judas actually betrays him, right? And Peter denies him when they're apart from him. They have been with him for years. Are you abiding in Jesus? You don't have to put yourself in Jesus. That's a game that's called dead works. All you got to do is stay where God has put you. It's not that hard. It's simply don't leave. Don't leave. Stay in him. Abide in him. God's blessings are not in the believer, but they are in Christ. God doesn't put them in you. This is interesting, right? He doesn't put them in you. He puts you in Jesus and says, I want you to be dead to yourself and alive in my son. And now I want you to be in my son. And once you're in him, you now have access to all of these spiritual blessings in Jesus Christ. This is where he says, Paul says, all praise to God, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Can we say with Christ? You can open these blessings. You can enjoy these blessings. But what does this mean in a nutshell? Jesus is not our supplement. He is our source. It's without him, I am nothing. Paul says, for me to live is Christ. Paul, this aged apostle, right, this is saying, I live through Christ. I can do all things through Christ. Paul is, says in Philippians 3.19 that he will give it all up to be found in him. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to find myself to him. I want to be found in him. I want to know him. Once I'm in, I want to be rooted in him. I want to be grounded in him. If Paul can say that, how much more should we say that? To abide, to remain means to stay where you have been placed. See, the only distance between you and God is that really your awareness of his nearness. We're not praying. We don't pray to connect with God. We are praying from a connection we have in God. Prayer doesn't actually draw us nearer to God. It makes us more aware of his nearness. Jesus spends these verses in John 15 saying, abide, abide. He doesn't say, get in, get in, get in. He's saying, abide, remain in me, abide in my love. And then he says, whatever you ask, because you remain in me, I will do for you. See, Jesus is saying, you got in because of a new birth. And I want you to remain in me. I want you like a husband and a wife living together daily, like an iPad that's connected to a Wi-Fi house, like a light bulb in its socket. I want you to stay in me and out of this place. When you're in that place remaining, now you can live. Out of this place, now you can love. Out of this place, now you can raise your family. Out of this place, you can obey. 
out of this place, you can confess your sins. Out of this place, you can deal with your trauma and your brokenness. Out of this place, you can praise my name. This is what Paul says. He says, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ. Can we say in Christ? In Christ Jesus. This is the will of God for you and the Lord. Even the dead in Christ will rise in Christ. I mean, there's no way around it, guys. In Christ. All right? So, just want to, as I'm closing today, I just thinking about if you're an outsider or if you're a seeker today, Jesus says, come to me. And to those who are here who believed in him, he says, abide in me. So maybe you're here today and you've left. And, and I'm not going to get into the whole like Christian losing salvation the whole night, but you know one thing is that feeling like you've left being with Jesus. And whether it's like the 70 disciples who left because of an offense, or whether it's like Judas, you left through deception of the enemy, whichever way, whether you just kind of walked away like the prodigal son and you just left. And there's a, there's a difference. There's a couple of types of leaving. You know, for example, a few weeks ago, I um, went to Florida for a few days and I left my house. But, you know, I left my house, but I didn't leave my house. You know what I'm saying? I was just I was just gone for a little while apart from my wife. And, and, my, and yes, my closeness to my wife was affected in that time, but I was still in that house legally, right? And I was still with my, my wife legally. My address had not changed. But for example, the way I left my parents' house, I actually left, right? I no longer live in North Carolina. I have not considered it home for a long time. Maybe that's how you've been. Not only just experience, as Simeon says, again, not only have you just experienced your closeness to God has been affected by maybe certain things you've been through and you've went through in, in the last few days or a few weeks or a few months or a few years, maybe it's been. But I'm talking about if you're here today and it's been, it's been years and you've actually moved out of Jesus. I'm not saying you hate him, right? I'm, not, I'm, just, saying, I'm just saying you've, you've changed your address, You've moved back into yourself. You found that the Adam, your old nature, feels a little bit more familiar and safe. And you've been living by a set of rules, now going between pride and self-loathing. It's time to get off the cycle. So if you've moved out, you've changed your address, your dwelling place, I want to invite you back. The Father still has room for you. And if you're here just to escape hell, my friend, I'm going to just tell you something to encourage you today. This is what Jesus is really offering. Jesus is not offering escapism. He's offering an entrance into a new family. He's offering himself. He wants to give you a new nature. He w doesn't want you to wait to die so that you can be delivered from sin. He, does, he wants you to experience freedom from the power of sin today. He wants you to experience new life. He wants you to open up this gift box of the Father's love today and experience his goodness, his blessings, experience his love so that you don't even want to live outside of him. That's the gospel truth, that he loved us and he died for us. And he rose again with victory over sin and the finality of death. And his death now can become our death. And when we allow our old man to be crucified with him, his resurrection can be our resurrection victory every spiritual blessing amen let's pray heavenly father as we conclude the time together and just pray lord say thank you we're grateful thank you for your grace we acknowledge that what you offer through jesus is not merely an escape from condemnation but an invitation into a new family bound by love and grace and redemption. God, help us to grasp the depth of this reality. Through Jesus, we are offered not only forgiveness, but transformation, a new nature that frees us from the power of sin. God, we may, may we not delay in embracing this gift of freedom. Help us, God, to live each day empowered by your spirit to walk in righteousness and experience the abundant life that you have promised. Let your love permeate our hearts. 
so deeply that sin loses its allure. Let it permeate so deeply that we find our greatest joy in pleasing you. May the truth of your gospel resound in our hearts, God, that through Christ's death and resurrection, we have victory over sin and access to every spiritual blessing. May we walk in this truth today, living as witnesses of your grace and of your mercy. It's in your name, Jesus. We pray. Amen.